Last Sunday morning after worship, Debbie said, you left us hanging. I plead guilty. In recent sermons, we have studied Jesus' predictions that the disciples would fail him. One of them will betray him. The others will desert him. This morning, we will study the fulfillment of two of Jesus' failure predictions. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 43. Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 43. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. As we look at our text, we first see this failure, the failure of betrayal, verses 43 and following. We have the arrest. Now, keep in mind that Jesus has observed the Passover and instituted the Lord's Supper with the disciples. He has then gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. He has prayed there that he might be spared what he's about to undergo. And in the context of those gatherings with the twelve, he had said, one of you will betray me. And he had said, the rest of you will desert me. You will fail me. Of course, Peter said, no, I won't do that. In fact, I will die with you if necessary. The others joined in and said, well, we will do the same thing. We will not deny you. We will, di we will die with you. Here we are, though. They've now come to the point. Jesus has finished praying. He sees the group of men approaching more than likely. They were up on the Mount of Olives. There was a valley. The Jerusalem was on the hill. They probably saw the torches coming and the group of men coming toward them. But at any rate, Jesus says, the time has come. The hour has come. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer, the previous verse. So, while he was speaking, Judas arrived. Mark tells us he was one of the twelve. That's kind of an interesting designation. That we're reminded that the one who betrayed Jesus was one of his closest associates, one of the twelve apostles. Judas appeared. He brought with him a crowd armed with swords and clubs. They were doing the dirty work of the religious leaders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, this crowd is not a lynch mob. They come armed with swords and clubs. They were a delegation sent by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. The group included a servant of the high priest. David Garland writes, A grim realism stamps Mark's account of Jesus' arrest. A misguided rabble, deputized by the temple officials, invades Gethsemane with swords and clubs. They came out armed to the teeth, as if Jesus were some terrorist bandit bent on revolutionary upheaval. To them, it might have seemed the wise precaution. To the reader, they only look foolish. To Mark's first readers, to us today, we realize this is silly. For this group of men to come armed, ready for some kind of terrorist, some kind of criminal. Well, verses 43 and 45 uh, mention who the betrayer is, that is Judas. More than likely, the crowd that came to arrest Jesus did not know Jesus very well. It's just a few years ago. There's a little fried chicken place on Franklin Avenue in Waco. I've never been there that I recall. But I remember a news story connected with it. A man was arrested by the police as he was trying to get some fried chicken there. Not because he was getting fried chicken, 
but because they thought he was a different man and there was a warrant out for his arrest. Even in our day where we have photography and kind of precise things, the wrong man was briefly arrested by the police. Well, keep in mind back here, we don't have photographs of people. It is now dark, the light's not very good, and perhaps most of these men had never been up close to Jesus. At any rate, they need a sign, an indication of who they have come to arrest. And Judas has prearranged a signal. After all, Judas knew the place where Jesus would be, and he also knew the person. So the signal that is given is a kiss. A kiss. In those days, men often greeted each other with a kiss. It was especially appropriate in practice for the student of a teacher, a rabbi, to greet him with a kiss, sometimes a kiss on the hand. We notice that Judas begins to kiss Jesus, and he calls him rabbi or teacher. And so here Jesus, Judas uses a sign of friendship, a sign of that would normally be for one who was loved and respected. And he does so with a kiss. Centuries later, a supposed friend's treachery is often indicated by the phrase, betrayed with a kiss. Now, according to Luke's gospel, <clears throat> Jesus asked Judas, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And yes, he was. Well, we have resistance, verse 47. Mark tells us that someone in the group with the sword cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. John's gospel identifies the sword wielder as Peter, that the servant's name is Malchus, and that the right ear was the one cut off, and also that Jesus rebuked Peter. Luke tells us in his gospel that Jesus healed the man's ear. Now think about what is happening here. You've got a group of armed men. It's been pointed out to them who Jesus is. Peter has the sword. He cuts off the servant's ear. Some have speculated he might have been aiming for a different part of the body. Imagine what could have happened at that moment. They've got one sword. The crowd has lots of swords and clubs. Jesus very quickly brings the situation back down, the attention level back down. He rebukes Peter for doing what he did, and he heals the servant's ear. Well, Jesus here is under arrest, or will be shortly, and we notice his response to this group that comes to arrest him. He asks the question, am I leading a rebellion? that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Am I leading a rebellion? That's his first question. They indicated they were, you know, they just thought they were out to arrest a violent man. The second question, observation, Jesus states to them that he could have easily, they could have easily arrested him while he was in the temple area. He hadn't been hiding. A number of days he was in the temple area teaching. Well, why hadn't they arrested him there? It's because the religious leaders were fearful of the reaction of the crowds if they tried to do that. Because Jesus was pretty popular with the average person. But no, they've come out here. They want to arrest him quietly, away from the crowds. And so they come under darkness, to a secluded place to arrest him. So Jesus rebukes them, I guess you would say, for their action, but not because he's being arrested, not because of what's going to happen to him. No, he says, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. This is why Jesus came. 
why God came to this earth as a man. He came here to die. He has prayed that if possible, he might not have to die, but he says, Lord, Father, your will be done. And now again, he says, this is the fulfillment of Scripture. Then we have the failure of desertion. Yes, Judas has failed Jesus by betraying him, but what about the others? Mark simply says, then everyone deserted him and fled. Matthew writes, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who a short time before had said that they would die with Jesus now flee, every man for himself. In verse 27, Jesus had referred to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, as a prediction of the disciples' coming failure. That scripture is now fulfilled. We have these men. One is betrayed him. Eleven now flee into the darkness. They're looking out for themselves. Now we do know from the Gospels that Peter follows at a distance. That's going to be significant in our next sermon. We know that John also came to where Jesus was being tried before the Jewish council. But the initial reaction is they're out of there. They don't want to get arrested. And then there is mention only in the Gospel of Mark about a young man. He's not wearing anything but a linen garment. <coughs> he was following Jesus. Indication is that maybe he didn't run off quite as quick as the 11 did, or the 12. But it says when they seized him, when they got hold of him, he left his garment behind. He fled naked into the night. Who was this young man? We can only speculate. And we will for just a minute. Why was he only wearing a linen garment? The thought is, well, maybe, and this is speculation, that he had come out to see what was going on and got out of bed and was in his bed clothes and came out to see what was going on. Earl McMillan wrote, The young man's identity is not disclosed. Perhaps he was sleeping in the house where Jesus ate the Last Supper and rose hastily from bed out of curiosity about what was happening, so as to follow Jesus to Gethsemane. If the house were that of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where the disciples met at a later date, it is possible that the young man was the evangelist himself, that is Mark. This thesis has some confirmation in the fact that these verses have no parallel in any of the other Gospels. Well, the thought is, and again, this is just speculation. Mark is the author of this gospel. And so he writes this little self-incriminating detail about himself. He doesn't name himself. He doesn't name himself at all in the book. But what an interesting memory. Here was a young man, maybe a teenager. He was there as Jesus was betrayed and arrested. He wanted to see what would happen. And he too felt that pressure of self-preservation. So much so that he fled naked into the night. The important point is not who the young man was, but that he fled with the others. Again, quoting from David Garland, the disciples' panic flight sharply contrast with the quiet dignity of Jesus, who has kept watch and is ready. Back in the garden, Jesus had told the disciples, you need to be praying so that you can face what is going to happen. Instead, they were sleeping. And sure enough, when it comes crunch time, Jesus is ready. He was praying. And his followers are not because they had been sleeping. 
Alan Black gives a good summary of today's text. He writes, The arrest apparently took place in the Olive Grove. Christologically, this same scene portrays Jesus willingly submitting to the will of God and fulfilling the scriptures. It begins Jesus' ordeal with the indignity of being arrested as though he were a criminal. In terms of discipleship, this is a low point in which the disciples serve as a strong counterexample to the behavior Mark wants to commend. One of them betrays Jesus, and the others flee, leaving him to face his ordeal alone. Tommy South comments, Other than Jesus, there isn't anyone who does the right thing. Only Jesus does what he's supposed to do. And aren't we thankful? When we see the failure of the disciples, <clears throat> there will be more. But we also see the one who did not fail, Jesus. And we should learn valuable lessons from both.